Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I'm your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our first time filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hello there. Hi, Christian. How are you? Good. Thank you. Sporting the Girl Who Wore Freedom t-shirt. Can we get those online somewhere? You can get that. You can get those in the Girl Who Wore Freedom shop, thegirlwhowarefreedom.com. Fantastic. And with us, as always, is our trusty, dusty research extraordinaire, button-pushing guy, Jason Rugg. Hey there. Jason, I'm, later you're going to have to tell me what camera you got because I, I think I might invest in that camera. So uh, it's, it's about $3,000. So <laughs> <laughs> Never mind. Never yeah. mind. <laughs> Used to use it to make short films and things, and now it's just a webcam. <laughs> <laughs> the most expensive webcam ever. Also much, yeah. is <laughs> Also with us is our producer of First Time Filmmaker Podcast, Documentary First, Brad. Brad, thanks for being here. Hello. Hey. And we have a World War II filmmaker extraordinaire guest today. Let's welcome our guest, Tim Gray. Tim, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. I'm admiring Brad's uh, dishwasher in the background. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's pretty great dishwasher. It stands it out awesome. mightily. It looks like a turbo boost one or something. You know? <laughs> I like your green uh, you know, door in the back. Listen, if you're just listening to this podcast, we're so sorry. You should check us out on YouTube uh, sometime because it really is fun to see everybody interact. Well, uh, es Tim, especially yeah, if, 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 if uh, Jason's going to spend $3,000 on a camera, you all need to come see this. So please watch him. <laughs> that's, Absolutely. that's right. Normally, I'm recording in a, in a literally a closet in our guest room. So what you normally see is our guest room. Ah. But today I decided to uh, show our, our trusty green door. Mm -hmm. Nice. I don't know why. <laughs> it was just a different decision. I think you made a good decision. Thanks. Oh, Tim, we are just so excited to have you here. I It's wonderful to see your face. I was commenting earlier, I haven't ever talked to you long enough to know you had a wonderful sense of humor. So I'm excited <laughs> to learn that. That's not the case, but thank you. <laughs> uh, so we have so much to talk to you about, um, you know, but we're going to dive in for a second and put a conversation with you on pause. Uh, because we do have some fun things to talk about this week. Christian, uh, what, as, what is new with The Girl Who Wore Freedom? Are we, we still have a distribution deal, yes? We do still have a distribution deal. That's super exciting. And we are, we have now uploaded our, uh, you know, film and our trailers to the distributors post house. It's now going through quality control, otherwise known as QC. We're really uh, crossing our fingers and saying our prayers that there are no problems that we have to fix. Uh, we feel pretty good about it. And so we are just waiting for them to give us that QC report to find out if there's anything else we need to do. We are still working on filling out our rights Bible. Uh, we have some shots we're still trying to track down. Most all of them are in, the, um, in NARA, which is the National Archives. And it's been very tricky because it is, they're basically shut down. They're all working remotely. It's very difficult uh, to, to deal with them right now. And so, uh, and, and they don't have a good database online, Tim, as I'm sure you have discovered. Uh, you really have to go in there when you're trying to get footage or photos. So uh, that's been our challenge this week is trying to um, you know, show everything that we have the rights to use. And uh, did I, one thing I can't remember, did we announce the Julian Dubuque uh, Iowa Film Festival last week? Yep, you did because did. you mentioned the American Pickers and and all that. Yes, I remember that. in Iowa. So, so we have had no new acceptances this week. However, we have launched at the Iowa Film Festival, so people can watch our film through the Iowa Film Festival. And there is a Q and A with me afterwards, which actually was really fun to do. And I think we have some new stories in that Q and A, so people can check that out. So that's really about it this week. No other awards. We're still topping out at what? 14. I know. It's so disappointing. So disappointing. <laughs> so, uh, but hopefully, I don't know, we'll see how things go in the Omaha Film Festival. So that's it right, for my update this week. Okay. Well, let, let's jump into our, our discussion with Tim. Tim is another World War II filmmaker. And I don't know if, if that's what you call yourself, but you've definitely made a lot. You are not a first time filmmaker you've made over what did you say 28 films and seven working on our number 28 right now yeah <clears throat> okay 
before we jump into that, because I'd like to learn more about how you got interested in World War II, you obviously have a passion for it. But prior to all this, I read you were a sportscaster. Is that right? I was. I was a TV sportscaster for about 15 years working, um, doing like the 6 and 11 o'clock news uh, around the country in Michigan, Washington State, Florida, New York, uh, Rhode Island, and then uh, got out of that in 2004. What, why? Well, 15 years, that seems like a good career. Why, why did you get out? Um, it was just time. I think, you know, you recognize the fact that you've had a run and, and that it was time to do something else. And um, it was just, it had been enough. You know, I got to do a lot of great things and cover a lot of great teams and interview a lot of great people and stuff. But there's always something kind of more that you wanted to accomplish. And that kind of led down to, to what we do now. So is what you do now, like full time is, is make World War II films? Yeah, full time, believe it or not. It's, um, we did our first film in 2006, and then we became a nonprofit foundation in 2011. So we've, we've done 27 um, that are airing nationally right now on American public television and around the world, and we're working on our 28th. And what we do is we have celebrities narrate all the films. So we've had Tom Selleck do a film. We've had Dan Aykroyd. We've had Gary Sinise do two. He's doing another one for us. Um, Liev Schreiber. Uh, we just had Luke Bryan, the country singer, do one. Um, Jim Nance from CBS, Tom Brokaw, Dan Rather, Matthew Broderick, um, you know, just a, just a cross section of people, even Bill Belichick, who hardly says anything at any time, um, narrated a Normandy film for us, and he was tremendous. So, um, yeah, so we do these films, we shoot them on location all over the world, and then we have these celebrities narrate them, and you know, it just has worked out really well. All right, let's hit the pause button right there. How... Is it because of your experience in media as a sportscaster that you're able to connect with all these celebrities or how, how does one do that? You know, it's not an easy process. We, we kind of identify somebody that we think would be a good voice for a particular film. And then, and then we start the reach out process, which is generally going through their agents and their representatives. And I mean, there are a lot of people who have said no, and, and, and that's fine. I mean, I, I tried to get Steve Perry from Journey to do one of my films just because I love Journey. You know, I grew up in the 80s. <laughs> It was my band and stuff. And, and I said, wouldn't it be cool to be on the phone with Steve Perry talking about journey? <laughs> but, but there are a lot of them who just, you know, because of their busy schedules, just don't have the time to do it. But so it's a constant outreach um, in terms of uh, people we want to have the films. I mean, Liev Schreiber is the gold standard, along with Gary Sinise, uh, in terms of being able to narrate our films. So fortunately, we have good relationships with them. So one generally leads to another. Um, but it's not an easy process. I mean, it's Anytime you're dealing with anybody in the entertainment world, there's layers that you have to go through and it's it's difficult, but we've been really blessed and fortunate. So start at the beginning. You uh, you were doing sports casting. Was, yeah. there, was there an overlap of the World War II interest uh, or did you just like quit and then said, I'm going to start a World War II company? Yeah, that's movies. basically what my, my father said. He's like, what are you nuts? He's like, how are you going to make a, how are you going to make a living doing, you know, this is kind of a niche thing. And he's a former journalist as well. I just always been interested in the topic since probably I was six years old. World War II has always been something since I picked up my first book. And so I've always read, I always have a World War II book with me. I'm always watching a documentary. I'm always watching a feature film. So that was from, you know, age six. So then being a journalist for 15 years, it teaches you how to write and to work under deadlines. I mean, we had two or three deadlines a day, you know, in television. If you don't make the deadline, then the story doesn't make air or you look like an idiot. So, you know, the writing is something I always really enjoy. That's why I got into TV sports because I love to write and I love to do interviews. So then after having that run, I'm like, well, what's next? What else do I love where I can put that practice, my journalism degree that my parents paid for, put that towards my other passion, which is World War II. So it's basically just taking the writing and the interviewing and everything else and just switching it all over from you know, Tiger Woods and Shaquille O'Neal to Omaha Beach D-Day veteran or Peleliu veteran in the Pacific or Guadalcanal or whatever it is. So, um, but it's definitely been just totally rewarding in terms of the people we've met and the people we've been able to interview and the films we've been able to do. So you have an extensive knowledge of World War II. You have a passion for it. You, you're good at writing, but where, where do the filmmaking skills come in? Did you hire other people or did you do it everything yourself? What's your background in that? 
I'm smart enough to hire other people to handle all the technical stuff <laughs> because you know, like my wife likes to say, you know, stay away from an electric toothbrush. You're going to stab yourself in the eye. <laughs> so fortunately I worked with some really good people in television who were photographers, videographers, and editors. And then when I started to do this, I reached out to them again, guys I'd worked with in other markets and said, this is what I'm doing. Are you interested? And, and then all of a sudden they become my, 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 my videographers, my editors, my sound people. So I handle the writing, the producing, and, and the directing of all the films, but I leave that up to the people who are really good at, at doing that. So um, it's, like I said, it's just surrounding yourself with really good people. And that, that, that's the key to making any film, as you guys know. It's just surround yourself with people who are really good at what they do and let them do what they do best. So. Christian is really good at that. She's really good at rounding up she people. She, she's so good. <laughs> they will do stuff for her for free forever. <laughs> and I don't, quite, I don't get that anymore. The first <laughs> film is like, I'll give you a discount. But when you get to like 15 and 16, they're like, hmm. No. <laughs> I'm sure no. it's absolutely going to be the same in my situation. But I have to tell you, after this one where we did this collaborative effort and everybody is working volunteer, I don't ever want to do that again. I actually really want to pay people anyway. Yeah. Um, people have worked so hard and the success of this film right. has been because of their blood, sweat and tears. And I do feel an obligation to, you know, compensate them for yeah. that anyway. Yeah, no, I understand. I mean, that, that we have people, the people who work with us go above and beyond. I'd love to pay them more than I pay them now. And they, and they certainly, because of the topic, take a discount because we're trying to preserve these stories for future generations. They take a discount. So even the narrators, a lot of the times, recognize as a nonprofit what we're trying to do. So Leah Schreiber, who would charge HBO, you know, tens of thousands of dollars to do some kind of program on their network, doesn't doesn't do that when he when he's working with us. So what we're doing is important, but you you do want to 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 pay people because that's how they survive as well. Yeah. Well, speaking of paying people. How, if you're a non for profit, how how are you raising money? That seems to be one of the biggest challenges in the world of filmmaking, period, but especially yeah. documentary filmmaking. But can yeah. I interrupt before you answer that no, question? No, you can't, because I'm just about to answer that question. So. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. It's your show. I, I have continue. to inter. I have to interject because this intersects with how I met Tim, and I absolutely love this. I learned about him when I went to Normandy for the 2015 anniversary, and I saw advertisements for the World War II Film Festival. This was before I was a filmmaker, before I ever wanted to be a filmmaker, but all I wanted to do was go to that film festival because they had Band of Brothers actors there and World War II veterans. That's kind of the thing. You can go and meet these people, and so in 2015, I was just, I didn't even know anybody there and uh, wasn't, you know, didn't go. But in 2018, that became my goal. When I knew I was going to do a film, the one film I wanted, festival I wanted to be in was his. That remains true to this day is that I really want to be there. And, um, but I knew he had done this. I knew he was like one of the preeminent World War II uh, filmmakers out there. And so I really wanted to know where to start. So I gave him a call. He was willing to talk to me. Uh, and, <laughs> but his email was, I'll talk to you as long as you're not asking me for money. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and I was like, I am totally fine with that. I just need to, you to point me in the right direction, tell me a few things. And so that was our first conversation because I think what you shared to me, and I remember you saying this vividly, that rate, money raising part will be the hardest thing you ever do. That's mm -hmm. what you told me. Yeah, it is. I mean, it still is. We've done 27 of these and it's just a grind. It's not... For, for people who are who have creative minds, asking other people for money is a very difficult thing. My background was journalism, so I never had to ask anybody for money. I mean, I got a paycheck every every two weeks in direct deposit, but I never, besides you asking your parents for 20 bucks here or there, you know, it's not a comfortable feeling, but for some people it is. Some people are just total sales and want to make the sale and everything, um, but it's not a comfortable thing. And, um, you know, it's, it's just very uncomfortable for people with creative minds because they want to 
create. They don't want the stress of having to have the other resource that provides for you to create. Um, and it's still very difficult. And um, you you have but to it make looks connections. Like, you, uh, go it ahead. looks like you've become a, a now that's become your job, I would assume, because not only are you making films, but you have a foundation that is doing very big things. You've you've made uh, statues to memorialize people and events and things like that. And none of that is possible without raising money. So somehow you got comfortable with that. You, at make, your some peace, point. you make your peace with it and realize it's kind of a necessary thing. But, but I always felt as though when we raise money, we have to get to the right people. We need to find that CEO whose dad landed in Normandy, or we need to find that CEO whose dad witnessed Pearl Harbor or was a Marine in the Pacific. Um, this is something you need to make a personal connection. And that, that's how we've been able to raise our money is, is have these people involved like Fred Smith at FedEx, who was uh, a Vietnam Marine, um, who was very interested and in helped bring the World War II Memorial to Washington, D.C. We, you know, we, we try to find people who understand our mission. If I were to go to somebody who had no idea about World War II, the chances are that corporate or that individual person is not going to give us any money. But we always said, if we're going to do this, we have to we have to appeal to someone's passion that they're proud of what their parents did during that time. And we've been very fortunate, not only in the narrators that we've had, who all seem to have a World War II connection, but to the sponsors that we have who are either a interested in World War II or had a family member caught up in World War II. So that's how we've been able to do, you know, and sell everything that we've been able to do. And, and we've been very blessed with the people that we've been able to find because, you know, knock on, knock on wood and everything, they've come back year after year because they believe in our mission. But yeah, fundraising is not, you know, get, I haven't heard no this often since I was dating in high school. I mean, it's <laughs> just kind of like, you just get used to it. You know, you just become, you get that thousand yard stare and, you know, being in combat and you just, okay, they said, no, let's move on to the next one. Okay. They said, no, let's move on to the next one. And you get 98 no's. And then the 99th, you get a Fred Smith at FedEx who says, I, I believe in what you're doing. Here's some money for this project. So you hear a lot of no's, but you just have to believe in what you're doing and be persistent. When Ken Burns said in the the only class I ever took about how making a film, which was his documentary class, when he said he keeps two binders of rejections on his desk, I was like, Ken Burns gets yeah, right, rejections huh? for his projects? Seriously? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I was like, clearly that's just a thing. It is. It's, you a, it's something you have it. to go through. It's like, it's something you have to go through. Ken, Ken Burns... Um, to me, I've met him a couple of times. I mean, he's one of my mentors in the way he tells a story. It's straightforward. There's not a lot of computer graphics. There's not a lot of crazy music. I mean, it's really just visuals and it's strong writing and it's storytelling. But yeah, when he first started out, people were probably like, you know, I don't know who Ken Burns is and why would I give you money? And then all of a sudden he does a series on the Civil War and all of a sudden he's got some cachet and then he does something on baseball and it just goes from there. But yeah, I mean, people don't know you know, anything about you, they're, they're less likely to, to give money, but you know, uh, it's, it's like anything else, anyone's achieved anything. They've all, they've all been rejected at some point by somebody. I mean, Dean Smith, you know, kept Michael Jordan under 20 points a game at North Carolina. And he's the only one who's ever held Michael Jordan under 20 points a game because he was his coach and he just wouldn't let Michael become who Michael became. And so there's always something that you have to get past to, to become who you are. And I think, you know, that's, that's just it, the same for filmmakers or, or golfers or mechanics or who, whatever field you're in. So good piece of advice. That's for sure. So we have a, a lot of first time filmmakers who listen uh, to this podcast. And so what, what advice would you give going back to the beginning? Uh, understanding not everyone has a background like yours and knows, you know, other cameramen and producers and things like that. What advice would you give a first-time filmmaker? My advice would be, if you're going to do something, find something that nobody else has done before and do a story on that. Because you don't want to be lumped into that group that's done uh, 150 documentaries on yoga. You want, to, you want to look at something and say, boy, you know, no one's ever really done anything on this topic. I think I can be kind of groundbreaking in that regard, even though I don't have all the bells and whistles. Um, so anytime we do a film, we always say, has this been done? If it's been done, how do we do it differently? And that's the first thing we always ask in any film that we do is, 
how do we do it differently? How do we incorporate new interviews or, or find new footage or, or take it in a way it's never been taken before, whether that be with a storyline or a narrator or something. So everything we do, um, we try to, to just make sure it's not been done in the same vein. And uh, for any filmmaker, I would say you, you can shoot a documentary with a, with a smartphone these days with editing software and everything else. So it doesn't have to be a Ken Burns feature, but, but find something out there that separates you from everybody else in terms of you know, how, how you present it, how you write it, how the story is told. And then that gets your foot in the, in the door. And not every band is supposed to, to sound alike. When Queen came out, they had such a unique sound that people didn't know what to do with it, but it was their sound and it was unique. And Freddie Mercury was you know, an amazing talent and, and they didn't know what to do with it because no one else was doing anything like Queen was doing, for example. Um, but then it slowly progressed to you know, Bohemian Rhapsody and, and, and everything else. So just do it a different way. That's the best advice. So if you had to look back at your career, I, I think one of the first things you did was in 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's like 15 years ago. If mm -hmm. you uh, look back over the course of your time as a filmmaker, um, what mistakes did you make that you learned from along the way that have made you better? Hmm. Um, that's a good question. I mean, the first film is always... Um, that was a real financial, like scratch it out. Our budgets are much bigger these days than they were for that first film. So that was like, let's get one under our belt as cheaply as possible. So we got to take six veterans back to France or five veterans back to France. And how do we make it look good on a budget of, you know, not, not that, that much. And how do we not go in the hole on our first film? Um, anything else? It's just repetition. It's the writing I think has gotten better. And you learn and you learn as a filmmaker when not to get in the way of the story being told. And so sometimes what we'll do is for our films is I want my writing, I want the people in the film to be featured more than I want my writing to be. So what we do sometimes is we'll put all our sound bites into a timeline first, not even any narration or anything. I'll pick out all the sound bites I want and the order I want them to go in and the order I think the story is going to be told. And that forces me to then, after all the sound bites are in and everything is, is tightened up and everything, it forces me to write really tight. So the emphasis is always on the stories because there's no way you want to take a Auschwitz survivor back to Auschwitz and get in the way of him not being able to tell you what he saw and experienced. And that to me is my greatest fear is that we'll get in the way of a veteran telling his story, but with too much narration or too many other things that we add to a film. So to me, the most important thing is let that person who was there and witnessed it tell their story. And I can, I can fill in around that, but you have to really, you know, I think that's something that we've learned over the years is, is, is really reinforcing the fact that you let the people and the events become the focus and then whatever you need to do after becomes secondary or, or third in the priority list. I love that window into your process. If you had to take us back a little further and give us a, a, a you know, sort of the workflow of your process, can you do that? So you start with some story, an idea, and where does it go from there? It, you know, we're, we're working like we have, we're working, we just finished one film, we're working on another, but I'm already in post-production on seven others. So what I mean by that is while I'm writing this new film, we're doing a film on Elvis in the USS Arizona Memorial, I'm collecting interviews for a film I'm going to do next year on the Seabees for the 80th anniversary of the CBs that Dan Rather is going to narrate for us. So there's always that because that generation's passing away so quickly that you, you have to be bringing in resources while you're working on, so you're multitasking all over the place. So I'm setting up shoots in California and Idaho, you know, this week, and we had one in the UK last week. And, and these are films I'm not going to be doing for two or three years. So it's just the juggling of recognizing what's in front of you and what you need two years out while also working on what you're working on now. And, and that's always juggling, you know, what, what we do. And that's, that's, that's difficult, but, um, that, that goes into the learning process as well. We've had some great interviews die two days before we went to get them, uh, veteran to pass away two days before we went to, to, to shoot them. So anytime we identify a film now, the first thing is get to the veteran, get to the survivor, right. you know, don't worry about anything else, no archival footage, anything else to get to that person, because once they're gone, it makes the interview a hell of a lot more difficult <laughs> to do. 
So we do that. We identify a film. So I've got all my interviews for the CB film done, and we're, still, we're not going to get to that for another year and a half. I got interviews for a film on Merrill's Marauders done. We're not going to get to that till next year. So um, I've got interviews for a film that on a French resistance that we won't get to for three years. I got them all done because you need to get those done right now. But- I noticed that with uh, Dick Winters because the film you know came out in 2012, but I know he died in 2011. So you must have shot that you know, in 2010 or something like that. Are you asking me to leave? Are you opening the door for me to leave or? (laughs) No, I was opening the door for my dog to come in. Who's sitting there quietly scratching at the door, driving me nuts. Quiet dog. I've not, you know, our dogs are like, you know, um, but no, I mean, we, we, sometimes we partner with other organizations. Um, if we know like Dick Winters, um, someone has done an interview with Dick Winters, we'll go to the other organization and say, listen, we, we've got this film on Dick Winters, um, coming up and, and you did this great interview with Dick Winters. Do you mind if we have some of your footage? And most of the time filmmakers are in a, in a, in a pretty tight fraternity or sorority in a lot, in some cases they will share things with you. So we actually got Winters, um, interview, um, from Adam Makos and his family. Um, Adam's written a bunch of New York Times bestselling books, but they were very tight with the Band of Brothers. So we got that interview um, from them while also conducting interviews with the guys who were alive at the time, like Bill Garnier and Babe Heffron and, and uh, Buck Compton. So it's, it's really a puzzle. It's just putting all the pieces together. So, yeah, and I would really encourage people to watch that. Uh, it, it's called Dick Winter's Hang Tough. And I have to tell you, I was just stunned by watching it because I only just watched it for this and I had not seen it before. Mm. So uh, I was stunned how much your footage looked like mine. Yeah, uh, it's similar, especially was- with, with Charles. And you got some great stuff that I wish I had that in 2012 I didn't know existed. So I'm really mad at you and, <laughs> um, and, and jealous. And uh, you know, I've kicked a few walls and I even talk in my sleep and my wife's like, why are you mad at her? I'm like, well, she's got this footage of uh, Michelle de Valabier that I should have had for my film and I didn't know it existed. And I'm pissed, <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, that, that, that to me was uh, talking with Charles who owns Breakcore Manor, who knew Dick Winters. And that those are the moments that make films. Yeah. It's so interesting because um, the, and, and uh, Damien Lewis narrated that one. That was another celebrity actor that you got to narrate that that was a great intersection. So you can find that on Amazon prime. Um, what was so incredibly interesting, you know, I told you in our own personal email that Charles had given me one of the coins that his father had made. And in doing so, he told me the story about Dick Winters that he told in your film. Yeah. (laughs) You know, it was just, so for me, that was an overwhelming moment. Um, you know, that he gave me this challenge coin, uh, that I will always cherish, but uh, if you guys- He is an amazing man. Uh, Get a chance to watch that. You can watch all of Tim's films um, on Amazon Prime, I think. Is that true? Most of them are on there. You know, what's what's interesting when you talk about filmmakers, Amazon has just come up with a new policy um, since we're talking about Amazon where they're not taking documentaries anymore. So a lot of people who have done documentaries in the past and have looked to Amazon Prime um, and Amazon to host their documentaries so they can make money back for the money that they put into making those films. Amazon's got a new policy where they're not taking any more um, long format documentaries. And, and that's a huge, huge blow to, um, to filmmakers. And, and you, can, you can Google that and read about their new policy. And it took everybody by surprise. And there are just a lot of emerging filmmakers out there who are doing such great stuff. And, and then they have it on Amazon and they're able to make some of that money back. And now they don't even have that opportunity. So I don't know where it goes from here. Um, it's well, just a huge interestingly blow. enough, the, the guest we have coming next week, his name is Alex Mayer. He did a film, a documentary film on his journey kind of in uh, – you know, learning how to ski in the mountains and he released it on Amazon and like, you know, in one month he made $8,000 or something. I mean, he was, you know, another month, a hundred, but you know, it still, it was an outlet for him to recoup Mm -hmm. some of those costs. So that is a huge loss. um, Are they saying, do they take documentary series? Is it only just features or I think what is they're their- just looking internally now for, for their own uh, production. production. And then that's the way Netflix is now. And, and they've taken less from, from the filmmaking community. And um, it's just the way a lot of them are. They're coming up with their own original programming and investing a lot of money in that Apple too, and, and others. So, but this, this, this to me was just a huge, um, 
blow because I know a lot of filmmakers who are were hoping to get their their stuff on Amazon Prime and hoping to make something back of the money, their own money that they put in. And it's it's too bad because there's so many great documentary filmmakers around the world who don't have this big outlet now to do this. And I hope they change their policy. I really do. Well, so speaking of distribution, it, it looks like as best I can tell, your your model has been you make a movie, you write, produce and direct it, does keep your budget slow, I'm assuming, um, and then you give it away. Yeah. So so talk to me about about that financial model and that distribution model. They kind of go hand in hand. But tell me what your thinking is about that and how that has worked for you over the last 28 year, you know, films. Yeah, it's uh, as a nonprofit, our mission has always been education. So what we do for our films, our model has been is that we raise all our money on the front end of the film to pay for everything that goes into the production of a documentary. Um, and, and ours are not cheap because we're traveling back to the Philippines, we're traveling to Japan, we're going to Guadalcanal, we're going to Poland and Germany, and we go to Normandy every year and, and other places. So the budgets um, are, are not uh, small budgets. Uh, for what we do. So we raise all our money on the front end through corporate and individual donations and sometimes grants. And on the back end, we make it available all for free by donating all of our films to American public television. And they are then they air nationally all over on public television and PBS stations around the country. Um, and then, um, so yeah, it's it's an interesting model, but our whole mission is education. So we don't want to bury or put a barrier up between the viewer and the content. So we also make all of our films available for free on our website. So every film that we've done is on our website available to students and educators and, and the public. So it's a unique model, but as a nonprofit, it seems to be the model that works best for us for attracting corporate and individual donors because we are a non nonprofit. And on the back end, we are making this available for free as a resource. So um, you know, we're not a dot com. We're not looking to make money off these films. We're looking for people to 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 get something out of them where they want to go and learn more about these men and women and and World War II. So it's just a model that's worked for us. Can you speak to uh, on your website, Tim? You mentioned that you don't just make films. You you make them in a way that's geared towards educating students, like based on how students learn. Can you speak to mm -hmm. that? We, we try because students learn visually. Um, we try as a conduit to hook them on World War II with one personal story. It may be the personal story of Dick Winters. It may be the personal story of, um, of the survivor we took back to Auschwitz and, and Poland and Germany. Um, our whole goal is to introduce the student or the educator to one story and then let them take it from there. We're not the be all end all. We're not the history channel. We're not American, you know, heroes channel. We're not um, some of these bigger, you know, networks. Our goal is to give them an introduction, a story that will hook their interest. So they'll want to go and learn more about D-Day or Pearl Harbor. Um, again, just being that conduit um, to learning more. And, and the way students learn, as I said, is, is visual. So now we're starting to do virtual reality films, half hour films where you can, have a cardboard viewer. I've got one here, actually. You've got this cardboard viewer and you slip your smartphone in, into this cardboard viewer and you put it in here and then you look through here and you go to um, YouTube. YouTube has its own virtual reality channel. It's got about 3.4 million subscribers and you can watch a virtual reality film of what it's like to be standing on Omaha beach in Normandy. And while you're watching wow. standing among the waves and on the beach, you're hearing the veterans talk about their experience of landing there. And you're seeing archival footage of 1944. So you've got this immersive experience like Smithsonian has a video on here. If you put this on and you went to Smithsonian on YouTube, it's like you're diving with a shark, a great white shark in a shark cage. And when we give these to teenagers, the first thing they say is, wow. And it's because they're in a 3D experience without those expensive Oculus Quest, you know, head, headsets that cost $700. Um, so we're trying to ramp it up with this new technology. So not only providing the films 
now we're providing a VR experience. So we shot one of those in Normandy that's almost uh, edited, and then one at Pearl Harbor on the Arizona Memorial and around Fort Island there. So we're trying to bring that now as our next step in the evolution of documentary filmmaking. When so you it's shoot immersive, that- It's immersive. What, did somebody else have a question? Jason, was that you? No? When you shoot that, tell me how you shoot those films. What camera do you use? How do you shoot differently? I have no idea. <laughs> You're the writer I, guy. I hire a film crew who has <clears throat> expertise in doing this. Um, we hired one out of New York City, and they bring these really cool cameras on tripods that look nothing like cameras. It almost looks like you put it down, and it's got like a, a rotating head on it that captures this VR technology. Um and they do it with drones now. You can do VR with drones. Um, there's this emerging technology, but I tell them exactly what I want. And then they technically on their end go and do it, which I think is great. You know, there's a great line from the movie Kelly's Heroes where Donald Sutherland's character, you know, crap game, you know, he's lying in the sun and, and, and they're asking him, why you're not fixing the tank. He's like, I just drive them. I don't know what makes them work. You know, and, and that's the way I am. It's like, I have no idea how all this works, but I know when it's done and the professionals who do it, it is spectacular. So I tell them what I want and then they go and do it. But I have some knowledge of the technology, but, and the cameras look a lot different than a regular uh, 4k camera and everything else. Um, but when I see it completed, I'm like, oh my God. I mean, this is just like an immersive, you're almost standing on the beach. You're there in Normandy. And hopefully wow. that'll get a student to go again, Google Normandy, or someday actually want to go and stand in the American cemetery in Normandy and understand these 9,386 stars of David and white crosses, why they're there. Because they've looked at it and said, wow, you know, I've seen this in VR. I'd really like to go see the actual place. So that's our goal. That's the next step in what we're doing. But again, it's surrounding yourself with the best, talented people, just talented people who do this for a living whether you're you know, a writer or a photographer or an audio person, I just work with some really, really great people and, and let them do what they, what they do. And they always deliver somehow. Well, and I feel like ha you know, it also helps not only to surround yourself with the good people that have excellent ex expertise in their field, but that are passionate about mm -hmm. the subject matter. And that's yep. what I really try to focus on, you know, finding like-minded people who feel the way that I feel. And, and your mission is very similar to mine. I mm -hmm. have a passion to educate. I taught school for 10 years. I really know that children are our future. And if we can expire, you know, inspire them to think about things in a more expanded way, um, you know, looking back at our history and learning from that, we will be better off in the future. And so I just know that bringing along others who share that same vision is crucial to making a, a film that is full of heart mm -hmm. and that is well done for sure. And I see that in your work. I love your mission and how your passion for this has extended far beyond filmmaking. I mean, talk a little bit about your education center because you've taken that that same mentality into this foundation. I haven't been to the building. You're in New Kingstown, right? Or South Kingstown in Rhode South Island? Kingstown, yeah, which is the southern part of Rhode Island down by the water. And um, my wife was ha happy because everywhere I went, um, I bring back these artifacts and they'd end up in our finished basement. And after a while, we couldn't take people down to our finished basement because there was so much stuff down here. And I'm like, hey, I think I should start a museum. And she's like, yes, start a museum. <laughs> start it tomorrow. And so she had the, she had the basement refinished when I got my last German helmet out of here. And, um, so we have about 4,000 artifacts in, in this education center that the kids can actually touch and hold and wear. And, um, and we have a cinema that seats about 40 and a library, about 600 books that kids can check out. So we had a lot of school kids coming in from all over Rhode Island and, and Southern New England until COVID hit. And then that stopped. So we've been doing a lot of it virtually, but the education center to me is a place where um, teachers will bring their students and it's really the only exposure that class will get to World War II um, that year because it's just not taught that much in schools anymore. If they do teach it, it's, it's, it's in a day or a half day or something like that. So the teachers 
find that their students get a lot more by coming to our place and having us give a tour and having, you know, seeing all these artifacts in color up close and everything else than they ever would get watching uh, something in a classroom for a half hour. So it's a very tactile experience, which I think kids need. So, um, yeah, so that the the center is really before COVID, the center had really taken off, and um, we've got two storage units full of stuff that we can't fit in the building that we're in now, including a hundred and five millimeter howitzer, which is a very wow. large field artillery gun. Looks um, like you're looking for a new space. Yeah, we're going to have to get a new space eventually. Yeah, but yeah, it's been that's exciting, it's been, and, that, and that's become our office too. And um, we've had a lot of veterans come through there, but. We've had a couple thousand students through, and not one of them has ever been bored, which is great, which is makes me happy. That's wonderful. I can't wait to visit there. Yeah, anytime. Absolutely. So Jason, Bradley, Josh, you guys have any other questions? I feel like I've been hogging a lot of the time. You have, Christian. You have. It's not surprising. <laughs> um, <laughs> not surprising. <laughs> Thank you for admitting it. I, I, I do want to, before anyone forgets, ask, what's the website? people can go to, to watch your films? Sure. It's easy. It's WWII, like World War II, WWII foundation.org, O-R-G. See, it's not easy. You confuse me right away. No, because right away I'm like, no, there's three W's. It's www. Well, yeah, if you want to put those in. I was trying- You did two W's and like, since when is there only two W's? (laughs) Oh my gosh. I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to write this down. Let me me go through the whole thing. It's www.wwiifoundation.org. Or if we want to, not too many W's, it's just the WWII Foundation. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So we're going to put that in our show notes. Is there anything else you, I mean, how can people support you, Tim, and the work that you do? They can just go to the website and just check it out. And we really, you know, encourage students to visit and educators to visit and, um, and just check it out and what we're up to and what we're doing. There are lesson plans with each of our films. We have lesson plans that go along for each film that uh, the teachers can download. We've got a quizzes. We've got essay questions. So we make it so teachers can log in and, and become part of the, the, whole, the whole website. And then down after their students have watched the film, they can give them a quiz based on what we recommend and everything. So we've created this educational portal and we'll continue to move forward with the VR stuff and everything else. But I would just say, you know, for anybody out there who's a filmmaker, don't, don't take no for an answer. Um, and understand that the beginning is always a challenge, but you can, you know, get to where we are by just a lot of passion and a lot of hard work. And, and just as the soldiers did on Omaha beach, I tell anybody, I said, you know, if you watch saving private Ryan, you know, Tom Hanks's character, captain John Miller didn't turn around and get back on the boat. You know, they were getting decimated. All you can do is move forward. And there'll be a lot of challenges and everything, but just keep moving off the beach. Put your head down, strap your helmet on tight, and just keep moving up forward and off the beach. And those guys ended up in, you know, who who landed on D-Day, they ended up in in Germany and the war was over. So if you keep moving forward, you'll accomplish what you set out to do. Great words of wisdom, for sure. Well, we really love having you on here. I'd love to have you back because uh, I wouldn't want to talk no- nuts and bolts of distribution and all these other film <laughs> nerd questions. All I have the stuff so that put people you. to sleep, you know, all that other stuff. <laughs> yep. All right. Well, Brad or Jason, anything else before we wrap up? I want a question from Brad. All right, Brad, um, up to you. So I've been, the only question I have is, and every time I ask this question, I always get almost the same answer of they're all different, but do you have, did you have a film when you set out that you definitely was like, this is the film that I want to make, or do you have a favorite one that you, you have made that maybe you had to wait a few to get your chops before you started it? But is there a favorite one that you've done? Well, Brad, they're all different. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, them all. I love, I love them, them all. all they're the all same. My, I love them all I'm equally. They're, yeah. they're all my children. Um, I think any time, you go back to a place like Auschwitz with a survivor who witnessed what happened there. Um, I've been on, a, been to a lot of places and a lot of weird, you know, Japanese caves on Peleliu and Guadalcanal and, and weird places and jungle and all kinds of things. The only time I've ever had a physical reaction was walking into a gas chamber 
at Auschwitz, at the first Auschwitz. There were three Auschwitz camps. And the first one is Auschwitz number one. And you walk into this room and you walk into this room where there's a wooden table and a chair, and then you make a left into this chamber. And that's where the people would gather and they would be gassed. And then there was a room next to that room where the ovens were, where the survivors, where, the, where they were, were once survivors, where the dead were cremated right there. Um, walking into that gas chamber, I actually got lightheaded. And I felt like for the first time in my life that I was having a reaction to a place where we were. And when you walk into this chamber and you see fingernail marks on the concrete walls inside the chamber, people who are trying to claw their way out of these concrete, you know, concrete in- structures um, with no chance of ever getting out, but to see the fingernail marks, um, to me, uh, that was such an impactful film because of the horrors that went there, what took place there. I mean, I walked the same path that tens of thousands of, of people walked who had no idea that they were about to die. They thought they were going to be taking a shower and they would get their clothes back and get their jewelry back and, and they, would, they would survive all this, but they didn't. And walking that same route was probably the most impactful and the most eerily, um, oh God, thinking of the word, uh, it just was such an impactful feeling. And, um, and if you don't believe in ghosts at that point, um, you never will. Um, but to go back with somebody whose family was was killed and who survived Auschwitz and who had the job of going around the camp every day on the same route, he would take this wagon around and he would pass all these families that were in this waiting area in the woods. And he knew it was going to happen to them. He knew they were all going to be gassed and, and cremated, but he couldn't stop and tell them that they were all about to die. This is when you don't get in the way as a filmmaker of, of a story. You let that person who saw it, experienced it, lived it, smelled it, tasted it, felt it, you let him explain to you what he saw because that's as close as you will ever get to the reality um, and message um, in, a, in a story. And the things he saw uh, were just so horrific that to me, that's probably the most impactful film that we've ever done. So not all of them are the same. And what's the title of that one? It's called "The Promise to My Father." Okay. Izzy Arbiter is the is the is the guy who survived. His parents and a younger brother were gassed and uh, cremated at a at a death camp called Treblinka. And uh, Izzy's married to a fellow Auschwitz survivor, so they're the only couple I know who both have tattoos on their forearms from Auschwitz. And uh, he survived, and he, um, you know, he went on to to survive because of a promise he made to his father who was put in one line and Izzy was put in another line and Izzy survived and his parents didn't. And his father told Izzy when he was put in the other line, Izzy wanted to go with his parents. And he said, you, his father knew what was going to happen. And his father told Izzy, he said, just remember what you saw here today and never forget this. And Izzy didn't. He went on to live his life and always talked about the Holocaust. And so there is, there is a, probably a most impactful film that we've done. Um, mm. But I encourage well, anybody have- anybody to go back to, to some of these camps like Auschwitz or Dachau and and uh, and just if you don't if you don't get lightheaded or get get a sick feeling in your stomach then then something's wrong. Well, I appreciate you telling us about that. We all will need to go and watch that. I I want to give a little plug for the Omaha Film Festival right now because there is a film in that film festival called An Inconvenient Time, mm-hmm. and it is a, a, a World War II Auschwitz survivor. Um, to, or she may have been in Treblinka talking about her experience. She was two and a half when mm-hmm. she had to watch her best friend and the family uh, be hanged in front of her eyes, and she remembers it. So it is very powerful when you hear those survivors recount their tales. And so you can watch that. Uh, there is a link on the girlywarfreedom.com slash festivals for the Omaha Film Festival. It says watch now and you can go there. You'll find our film and this inconvenient time film. Um, well, so, Tim, what what can we look from you next? What's coming next? Um, we're working on this uh, Elvis in the USS Arizona film, which is a story about <clears throat> how Elvis Presley helped get the USS Arizona Memorial built. Um, the effort to raise money for the memorial was struggling and, until Colonel Tom Parker, his manager, um, read an article that 
that about it, that it was struggling and asked Elvis if he would do a benefit concert at Pearl Harbor to help raise money for the uh, memorial. So on March 25th of 1961, Elvis played at Pearl Harbor and helped raise over $65,000 and really brought a lot of attention to the memorial to help it get over the finish line. And it's just a great story about um, how that came to be. We interviewed a lot of, uh, of uh, people who went to the actual concert, some of whom had witnessed Pearl Harbor happening um, as young kids. And uh, it's just one of those stories that, you know, it's got Elvis in it, which is great. And it's got you know, World War II in it, which is great. And we hope it attracts an audience that'll, again, want to learn more about the Arizona Memorial. So um, we're excited. That's going to be out Veterans Day. And um, it'll be shown at Pearl Harbor as part of the 80th anniversary ceremonies as well. That's so exciting. Congratulations yeah. on that. Anything I can't with wait Elvis to- in it is like, you know, if I can tie Elvis to World War II somehow, uh, my day is made. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> for sure. For sure. That's going to be a big hit. No question about that. Oh, Tim, thank you so much. You're welcome. For the thank time you guys. Here. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been great. And uh, everyone listening, thank you to listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.